Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, Regulation Crises is Averted or Just Delayed. This webcast is held jointly by the Chartered Banker Institute, Manchester Metropolitan University and ICAEW Northwest. In a moment, we will commence the webcast and meet today's chair and panelists. Ahead of this, please note that we are recording this webcast and it will be available to watch on demand shortly afterwards. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and our panelists will answer them during the webcast. We hope that you enjoy today's session and thank you so much for joining us. Catherine, over to you. Emma, thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, very warm welcome to everybody um, to this joint event today. Um, as Emma said, they're titled Regulation, Crises Averted or Just Delayed. Uh, my name is Catherine Yowds and I'll be chairing today's session. Uh, I am the programme leader for the Undergraduate Accounting and Finance programmes at Manchester Metropolitan University. So during this webinar today, we're going to consider how financial regulation put in place in response to the financial crisis has been developed and what have been the unintended consequences of that regulation and what can be learned for the future. Um, so we've got three uh, fantastic speakers today. Uh, we've got Dr. Gordon Mays, who is a lecturer in the Accounting, Finance and Banking um, Department at Manchester Metropolitan University. We've got Bill Dunkley, who is the Director and Solicitor Advocate at Pannoni Corporate. And we've got Rod Sellers, uh, Chartered Accountant and President-Elect at ICAEW Northwest. So I'm just going to ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves first of all and why they are taking part today. Um, so if I could start with you, Bill. Yes, thanks, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. So as, as Catherine said, I'm Bill Dunkley, Director in Pannoni Corporate Regulatory Team and in fact lead the team as well. And my role is to advise organisations and occasionally individuals within those organisations on their interactions with the, the criminal law, specifically their, their dealings with uh, the, the regulators. So not mainstream crime, but what perhaps anecdotally or colloquially is known as, as white collar offences. So including those investigated by health, health and safety executive, environment agency, the insolvency service, and even police led um, corporate manslaughter investigations and all the sort of weird and wonderful things that fall in between. Um, as a general rule, pe people generally don't like to see me because it usually means something has, has gone wrong or there's sort of the question mark of, of criminal investigation um, over them but my intention today and sort of why I've uh, it's one of the reasons I agreed to, to join in is just to provide an overview of my experiences across a, a range of different regulators and to see if there's any sort of common themes which can be drawn and perhaps help with anticipate what future trends um, might be. Thank you Bill. Uh, Gordon? come off mute. Hi everybody, um, I'm, I'm Gordon. Hi, nice to see you on the call. Um, I joined ManNet in uh, Manchester Metropolitan University in September 2021. Uh, I previously had a 20-year career in industry. Uh, I qualified as a chartered accountant, so kind of good background in the numbers side of things and financial reporting. I then joined uh, the banking sector in uh, 2011. Uh, prior to working a few years in the insurance sector during the crisis period. Uh, most of my time was spent at Lloyds Banking Group, best part of a decade. And I really got to see how post-crisis regulation and reform uh, was implemented uh, inside of the bank. So I worked, I worked at a group level, so very much kind of group strategy and planning, capital implementation, disposal of assets. So I've seen how the Basel regulations uh, changed. So that led me to say, right, I'm going to go and do uh, my doctoral thesis in this area because I'm quite interested in it in terms of how, how post-crisis reform was, uh, was, was kind of implemented and uh, enacted. So that's my, my research interest. And I have a broader research interest in financialization. And that's the study of uh, some of the more problematic nature of finance uh, when, when finance becomes too big or too problematic. It has, it has issues uh, in terms of wider society. Um, so, so that's why I'm, I'm really interested in this topic. I've seen it in real life uh, in terms of being at the table when some of the big decisions were made uh, at Lloyd's. And also then from the academic uh, point of view. So uh, I'm looking to publish a couple of research papers in these areas. So busily writing away as well as teaching. Um, so, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, I'm Rod. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Yes, I, like Gordon, I'm a chartered accountant, but I qualified before most of you were born. 
Uh, so, in fact, I've spent more than 50 years uh, in industry after qualifying, mainly as an FD, uh, uh, um, chief exec, but in the last half of my career as a non-exec. So I was very much involved in audit committees and in the development of businesses, many of them in the FTSE 350 range or increasingly more in the private sector, which I always found quite interesting. So I, despite my advancing years, still find some interest in this topic today, which is a bit surprising. But uh, I've been asked by the Institute in Manchester to head up the, uh, their new foray into uh, raising the profile of the Institute on behalf of its members in the business community in the Manchester and related areas. And, and hence I've been uh, volunteered, I think is the phrase, to join in this event today. Alongside that, I'm working with two uh, professors in building uh, a series of books, uh, we've done three and the fourth one's coming up, on the effects of disruption in the accounting and auditing world because there's been a fantastic change in the last 10 years in terms of how um, shareholders, stakeholders, businesses generally have looked upon the reporting and governance in their businesses and uh, so we're writing a book trying to, certainly in our fourth book, trying to envisage the different scenarios that will happen as we go over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And if we think of the changes over the last 10, 20, 30 years, I think you can be sure there's going to be a lot of very important changes as we go forward. The only problem is having a crystal ball to say what they'll be. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, so thank you for those introductions. Um, so in terms of today's session, each panelist is going to share their perspective on today's topic. And this will take around 20 to 25 minutes um, of the session. After that, there'll be plenty of time for questions. So um, those that have joined us today, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. If you could put your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, that just makes things easier. Um, but please feel free to add questions as we go along. Um, and I'll, um, at the, after the panelists have spoken, I'll then uh, go through them and, and ask the panelists those questions. So do put them in as and when um, they come to you. Um, so we'll um, get started with today's session then, and I think Bill is going to start the discussion for us. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, yeah, so as I said a couple of minutes ago, my intention really today over the next sort of seven or eight minutes is just to, to provide an overview based on, on my experience of, of regulation across a number of different regulatory and, and compliance regimes and not to, to perhaps focus on any specific regulator and leave that for, for others to speak about over the course of the next half hour or so on. The, the headline issue which I want to flag up at now and I'll, I'll come back to at the end is that you know, in my experience regulators um, aren't static in, in their approach and they do evolve and we've, we've seen changes certainly over the recent past as well as the more medium long term and I want to conclude or work towards today just sort of do these changes give an indication as to you know the, the future course of events so if we if we go back to the financial crash look it's, it's not in contention that that you know, change things. And certainly within the, the financial system, you know, there were quite dramatic and um, immediately and, and significant changes. So we had the, the Banking Reform Act, you know, the, the Financial Policy Committee was, was introduced, the, the abolition of Financial Service Authority, introduction of the Financial Conduct Authority. And then more, more recently, we've had the you know, Financial Standards and, and Markets Act. Um, changes haven't come about just because of the 2008 financial crash, though, but also more recently, and you know, they're not confined to the financial sector. In my experience of over a decade now in, in the law, there have always been differences between different regulators and how they regulate and, and achieve their function. But this, in my opinion, has been brought into quite sharp focus recently. And the, the events of the last two years with the, the pandemic uh, has impacted regulators in a number of, of profound ways. And I'm sort of going to, to speak quite generally now, but you know, they were all equally caught by the, the national the stay at home order, the, the closure of workplaces and the, the this limited the the opportunities for regulator intervention and um, across all different industry sectors there's had to be a, a modification in, in how they perform the function and my again my recent experience is that regulators across fears are, are taking sort of 
the the experiences of the last couple of years as a, as a learning exercise and are revising the regulatory approach and this isn't a temporary fix in response to lockdown and restrictions but sort of temporary restrictions have a, have a habit of becoming more permanent and that is what i think is, is starting to, to happen now so just picking one regulator the, the health and safety executive over the last decade it's had a funding cut of you know around a third to its budget and due to that lack of resources it's had to become very reactive in nature now by that i mean it's ha it's due to limited resources it has had to respond to adverse incidents um as they occur rather than being proactive and helping businesses to to achieve compliance and the, the relevant standards that combined with the, the lockdown has has caused it to investigate and, and explore new ways of working so what we have seen on a number of occasions now is the rather than the health and safety executive going into a, a business to investigate their view cctv footage remotely um and there have also been some of you on on the the session today might have been subject to the uh telephone interviews by the hc to check uh covid security and i was on the receiving end of one such call to have first-hand experience but the questions which were asked during that uh that experience included quite a lot of, of self-reflection and that's a topic i do want to return to in a couple of minutes but during that interview one of the questions the the individual asked on behalf of the hse was how would you as an organization rate your own uh, covid security measures on a scale of poor good or very good and, and likewise how do you uh, rate your understanding and, and the measures you've, you've put in place so as, as we've now come out of the, the last couple of years and, and lockdown and, and restrictions, you know, what, what appears to be the case is that actually there's going to be an increasing number of, of regulations. And in my experience, once regulations come in, they tend not to disappear. It's a, it's a, a one way street, really, in terms of the number of regulations which come into force. And once they're in place, they tend to, to stay. Um, so businesses going forward are going to have a wider variety of regulatory and compliance obligations just again by way of sort of one example the the environment act which came in last year now i could, I could spend an entire hour talking just about the implications of that but i'll, I'll sort of won't bore you with the details of that and save it for another time but part of that act is moving towards a, a circular economy increased reuse and sustainability and a continued war on plastic and how i see that act which in my opinion, perhaps has sort of gone under the radar of a lot of organisations to date, is that there's going to be sort of an, an increased requirement for organisations to demonstrate their environmental credentials. So some of you may be aware of the ESG, the Environmental, Social and Government Scores, which historically have perhaps been considered by organisations as part of investment opportunities or corporate decision making. But I suspect that's going to expand um, and, and sort of be something that businesses are required to demonstrate in much the same way as there are energy efficient ratings on white goods i think esg scores are going to become sort of much more um much more to the fore and you know not just looking at the environmental side but also um on the financial side the future regulatory framework consultation has, has recently concluded to ensure that the the regulatory framework for UK financial services remains fit for the future. And I leave it to others to, to perhaps pick up on during the course of the next 20 minutes or so. There is the, the entire question of regulation of crypto, um, which you know, I, I don't pass any further comment on, but simply highlight as an additional perhaps uh, regime of, of regulation that is, is perhaps going to come shortly down the line. So where does all of this leave organisations? Well, in my opinion, it's at something of a, of a crossroads. And my view is that to date, regulation, again, generally speaking, has been, been centralised, by which I mean that standards have been issued and prescribed and breaches investigated and forced through identifiable uh, regulators. But my opinion is that we are now moving towards what, what I would call decentralization and more self-assessment and perhaps on the face of it, more simplistic and, and light touch regulation in terms of what specifically is required. And I think that's a topic that Gordon might pick up on shortly. Now, the, I'm not saying that regulators are going away. And in fact, we've had two new regulators come online within sort of the last couple of months, the building safety regulator and the office for environmental protection. Now, as a, as a geeky regulatory lawyer with a mortgage to pay, that's sort of quite exciting to entirely new 
regulatory regimes which are going to come into force but my view is that the onus has started to or certainly will do over the, the near future is to, to move away from regulators prescribing measures to be adopted towards more self-regulation and a, and a risk-based approach I've, I've already mentioned the uh, health and safety executive interviews regarding COVID security and self-assessment but we've seen examples of that in other industries so for example money laundering certainly for law firms the most recent guidance places the, the responsibility for assessing risk onto individual law firms and for them to implement control measures which are relevant to the risks they experience likewise with with modern slavery requirements the the onus and the responsibilities on organizations to determine whether the legislation applies to them and if it is for them to then effectively self-audit their own supply chain and publish a statement as to the steps that they are taking to combat modern slavery rather than a regulator saying you need to do x y and, and z so what i see the direction of travel towards is is towards self-declaration of of their own compliance um and again I'm, i i do i, I generalize but my, the difficulty with with having a general framework only and perhaps standards to be achieved but no detail as to how they are to be achieved you know you can't prescribe what what steps are required and yet from my experience yes businesses are complying with this self-assessment to the extent that it's, it's already in existence but that in itself isn't a, a guarantee that standards are actually being met or, or understood and it's, it's outside the scope of you know the, my talk and the time that i have available today but you know the potential for potentially lax standards is is apparent and but for organizations to have genuinely held but objectively erroneous opinions and that may require sort of uh, a change in professionalism additional training but you know i leave that to others perhaps to, just to, to pick up on shortly so to, to bring everything together the the title of today's talk is it's crisis averted or, or just delayed and i'm going to give a very typical lawyer answer now and not actually answer the question directly but in my view, the answer probably is that it's neither averted nor delayed, but rather crises evolved and changed. And my view is that it's it's going to to continue. There's not going to be an end point. The, the regulations are going to, to keep coming. And, and how the question is then is how organisations deal with those changes. And I, I think that sort of brings my, my input to an end. I'm happy to take questions, and I, I think we're sort of going to take those towards the end. So, on that note, I will hand over to um, to Gordon. Thank you, thank you very much, Bill. I shall just share my screen. I have some uh, slides to share, so I shall just do that just now. Just hold on a second. You need to let me know if you can see it in a sec. Um, okay. Can you all see the, the slides? Hopefully. Yeah, we can see them, Gordon. Okay, that's great. So um, I'm going to talk uh, more about the banking and insurance sectors, which is which is uh, my, my more familiar uh, territory uh, in terms of my, my career and my, and my research, and, and probably more skewed towards uh, towards banks. But I think for insurers, you can can probably apply a lot of the thoughts that I've uh, I've, I've laid out here. Um, so really, I thought, how do I go and address this question? So I thought I'll do a report card. Uh, and see, well, crisis averted, what actions have strengthened, regulatory actions have strengthened uh, the framework that we, the financial services industry operates in, banks in particular, um, and then and then do the flip side, uh, kind of crisis delayed, has there, been, has there been some kind of downsides and problematic outcomes? Um, so starting with the, the kind of crisis averted, you know, it's very clear that the capital ratios of banks and insurers are significantly higher than, than before the crisis um, because, of, because of Basel III and, and the stress testing regime that's come in. Um, another key change on Basel III also was the liquidity ratios. So you now have the LCR, uh, liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio as well. So two kind of ratios have really changed the game on liquidity uh, for banks, uh, which is a big hole before the crisis. And um, so those are really important. Um, there's a significant, huge, significant amount of data now collected by, by regulators and supervisors. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible um, that the amount of uh, data submission that you're required to do uh, under, under the, the disclosure requirements, under the Basel rules. So um, yeah, really significant uh, increase in data capture. 
um, to give more data for regulators. Uh, so we've had add-ons now for large uh, G GSIBs or GSIBs banks or banks that we consider to be important for the broader financial system if one fails. So sy systemically important banks. So there's capital add-ons now as well. So that's inc incredibly important. Uh, we have ring fencing rules in the UK. Um, and again, capital add-ons for the big ring fence banks in the, in the UK. So again, there's been specific regulation to try and deal with some of the, the pre-crisis uh, regulations. Um, and I think generally speaking, my involvement with uh, regulators, I wasn't involved too directly because now uh, regulatory relationships are usually managed through uh, specific teams, uh, but the interactions they did have, they're very much more interventionist. Uh, I was just about in the process of leaving Lloyds when uh, the COVID crisis broke. Um, and you know the announcement came out to the public about the about uh, it was published about uh, dividends being halted during COVID, um, and and for that to happen pre-crisis would have been highly unlikely. It was very much a light touch approach. So the kind of paradigm that we're operating in with regulators has definitely changed. Um, Crisis delayed though, so on the flip side, um, if you look at the economics and the kind of political, what called political economy, the kind of economic data, underneath we have debt to GDP, stock market to GDP and property price uh, bubbles uh, going on over the last kind of decade, and that's put pressure on things like affordability. So these, in a sense, create instability that kind of counter against the objectives of regulation. So we ask a question, has regulation been able to deal with that? My, my kind of answer to that would be no. Um, but uh, there's more research behind that. That's one for another day. Um, so just, just those facts alone should make you kind of question uh, the regulatory reforms that have come in uh, post-crisis. Have they been adequate? Um, there's also been a rise of shadow banking sector. So shadow banking, for anybody that doesn't know, is a kind of sector that operates like a banking se sector. So provides finance, for example, but isn't actually regulated as a bank. Um, so there was a huge shift of assets into the shadow banking sector uh, as banks look to, to reduce their risk-weighted assets post the crisis. Um, and what that meant was it was the absolute worst time for banks to sell assets. You know, everybody knows that they're being forced to sell assets. That's not particularly good for the price that you're going to recover. And then who recovers the value? Well, it was the buyers. So, for example, private equity funds uh, and so on that, that, that gained from that process. Um, there's been uh, a wide a wide number of then knock-ons as well. So, for example, mortgage prisoners who, uh, uh, you know, stuck on very high variable rates, for example, and there's only recently in the last couple of years been action on that. So that these things have been allowed to persist. And then there's things like the green cell collapse. So that the, the green cell collapse, if you look back, that was a provider of finance to SMEs. And again, it got involved, it was sitting outside of the banking sector. So un, less regulated and, and caused huge problems for, for the SMEs involved. Um, so that, that's examples of the shadow banking sector that sits outside the bank um, banking system as it is regulated. Um, the other thing is regulation is very much post-crisis driving business, bank business models. So if you look at the JP Morgan, JP Morgan London whale losses, they were very much driven by the aim to reduce risk-weighted assets within the treasury function or the investment function within JP Morgan. Um, so there you have regulation driving a business model activity rather than it being an unintended consequence, which is used in a lot of the kind of explanations of regulations. And, and for me, that, that, that doesn't hold that, that unintended consequences. It's doing more than that. So my argument is that it, regulation starts to become what's called performative, it actually drives bank business model activity. And you can, you can use a say an, an engine, not a camera. So a camera is like a snapshot whereas an engine actually drives, uh, drives, drives the bank. So uh, that's by Donald McKenzie, who's, a, who's an academic who's looked at some of these, uh, these, these problems. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of crisis delayed for me, some of the kind of key things coming out of post-crisis reform. Now kind of looking ahead, we think about uh, what some of the, the big risks coming up ahead. So climate is the obvious one that, that, that everybody kind of knows about. It's been very prominent. Um, central banks becoming more involved. There's a big knowledge problem. So central banks are very much uh, PhD economics, finance theory, uh, behavioral economics as a way to try and explain some of the deficiencies in economics. Uh, that doesn't really cut it for climate and the problems that we have. So there's a big knowledge problem there. Um, the volume of regulation as well. How are we going to layer on top climate uh, regulations for climate, given uh, the number of pages of Basel regulations is, is already significant? And the original Basel one was about 60 pages uh, for to compare with that, that number of over a thousand. 
Uh, the time to implement, so seven to eight years to do uh, Basel III, for example, that is just too long for some of these challenges that we have. So how are we going to do that? Um, and also then the fair value uh, paradigm that we're in as well. So if we transition quickly, then you have a lot of assets that are suddenly not worth very much. So will that lead to, lead to crisis? Those are just some of the big examples. And, and there's a speech by the BIS called the Green Swan. Um, so things that we, we don't know about that potentially could uh, cause big problems. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of the theory that still underpins Basel III, uh, because if you, if you look at the left, we have the VAR model, which still underpins a lot of uh, a lot of Basel capital requirements, but actually for climate world we have what's called uh, tipping points or disruptive change. And I like to use this uh, example when I'm teaching, where you have the lot the distribution curve on the one side, which is traditional finance, but then you think about the egg rolling off the table. When the egg falls off the table, um, you know it causes a significant issue. So that's that's kind of a way I try to think about some of these things, uh, these problems that are that are out there. Um, FinTech is another uh, significant source, so we have the wire card collapse. That really highlighted that the that narrative has become important in business models and regulators find it very difficult to deal with that. And, and there was quite significant regulatory failures uh, in, in, that, in that collapse. Um, there's things like banks moving to cloud models with cost reduction uh, pressures, so that opens up new risk. Uh, and how can, how can regulators contribute to wider objectives that we might want societally, such as retaining access to cash, financial inclusion, and also access to digital and online? There's, there's a Lloyd study done recently saying that there's, I think it's in the region of two to three million people still don't have regular internet, fast internet access to be able to access apps. That's a significant number of people. Um, so how do we ensure that people are not left behind? Regulators need to be involved in that. Um, we also need to make sure that regulators intervene in competition, because if we have a dominant technology, then you're potentially into a really concentrated industry. And what role do the incumbent banks play? Uh, you know, your big banks that survived after the crisis, will they try and acquire fintech? And what will the regulator do about that? Uh, will, will they allow it or will they allow the fintech to, to, to kind of uh, retain its independence or be acquired by somebody else? Um, so new ways to think about regulation, I guess, um, given these challenges. So I think I think looking more broadly at what kind of banking and finance sec sector we want is really important and, and aligning regulation with policy, because at the moment there's inconsistencies in how policy and regulations are aligned. So I, th I take the example of help to buy, which um, didn't really achieve its objective. Most of the people who use help to buy uh, could have afforded the properties anyway. Uh, that was a national audit office report. Um, so there's an inconsistency about regulation and policy, uh, about how that was done, how that policy was implemented. Um, is there a size limit that we have on, on institutions and the wider finance sector and, and where finance becomes problematic? Um, and also we need to widen the involvement of more technocratic economics, which dominates how we set regulation. We need more involvement of a more diverse uh, thought group uh, that can contribute to better policy and regulation. Uh, as, a, as a part of the solution. Uh, more uh, diversity of bank business models, because we're still highly, highly concentrated towards shareholder value oriented banks. You look at Germany, Sweden, they all have alternative banking sectors that, that comprise quite a significant sector uh, proportion of the banking system. So what other kind of business models do we want to try and encourage? Um, the example I have is community banks, uh, which tried to, were formed three, four years ago. It's taken them three years to go through the regulatory process to get a full banking license. Uh, that, that is a long time for a relatively, in terms of systemic risk, limited risk. Um, and then broader frame about thinking more, more widely about economics. So there's different thoughts about how we might, might do this going forward. So donut economics, some of you might have heard that by Kate Raworth, which gives some alternatives to GDP and growth. And then another one is the foundational economy uh, at University of Manchester. There's a group uh, looking at this, this concept where uh, the, the everyday services in life, such as banking, kind of are, are taken out of uh, their current organisation. And, and, and there's different objectives, for example, financial inclusion, lending to specific sectors, for example, uh, local, local community finance. Uh, and that, that, was, that was my, uh, my, my whistle-stop tour. So I shall stop there and hand over to Rod. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Gordon mentioned Wirecard, and uh, that's an interesting one because uh, that's one that really did rock the financial institutions in, uh, in Germany. And in fact, I read in the papers this week that uh, three of the executives are now being charged. So 
uh, th these things we're talking about aren't just uh, UK based, they're, they're much broader. And in fact, in the paper today, there's talk that the US through the SEC, which is the regulator for the financial world in the, S in the States, uh, they're also looking at the problems of independence between uh, the big accounting firms, between what they do in uh, the audit and what they do in the non-audit uh, services. So it's an interesting change on uh, uh, internationally how this has all been looked at. Now in the UK, we've certainly had a handful of uh, cases which have come before the uh, regulator. Um, Carillion is probably the key one that we've all heard about, uh, but that was followed by uh, Patisserie Valerie, and uh, again, just a few days ago, one that I hadn't heard about before, but revolution, uh, something which has been going on for the last seven or eight years and only just come into the public domain uh, recently. So I, I, I'm concentrating on the role, almost like as a case study of the, uh, the financial regulator for the audit in the accounting world. Uh, that at the moment is the FRC, the Financial Reporting Council. But of course, uh, that is going to transition, we are told, if the government have time to do it, into ARGA, the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority. So get those letters into your, into your mind. And uh, it's ARGA that we're all going to be uh, concerned with. I nearly use the word worrying, but I think more concerned with to understand how it's going to develop. You see, in the past, the FRC uh, was accused of being quite tame. Um, it, uh, it was very slow, uh, but in the last what, four or five years, it's begun to show its teeth a bit more and some fairly substantial fines have been issued. But having said that, they're still very retrospective. And th the problem is that the retrospective fines and all the big four accounting firms have had, uh, have had that uh, uh, very clearly, uh, they've been the subject of these fines over the last few years, um, but it's all been retrospective. And there hasn't been as much talk in the media uh, about the more positive things which the FRC have been doing. They've issued several guidance notes and trying to encourage best practice, but uh, that doesn't get the attention of our, of our friendly media, who uh, obviously love to uh, highlight problems which have occurred with an individual company and how many millions have been uh, fined of those companies or more likely from their, um, from their auditors. I think one thing we do need to differentiate on in these situations where the regulator is looking at companies is where the scandals that we've seen have been due to negligence. Uh, and I think BHS and Patisserie Valerie can be ones where the auditor maybe uh, wasn't as thorough in their work as they perhaps could have been. And those which are judgmental, uh, there's some talk at the moment about Babcock, which is um, a major uh, construction company. And one of the biggest problems in accounting, for those of you who, who aren't born and bred accountants, is how do you do revenue recognition on long-term contracts? Now, Gordon and I, both accountants, could come up with completely different answers on the right way to deal with um, uh, profits, uh, revenues arising from long-term contracts. And we'd be right, both of us would be right, providing we've stated the parameters against which we are uh, working. So I think it's, uh, it's important for companies to be much more transparent in explaining how they've come to a view, what the judgment has been, and, and therefore the result of it. And we've got to be careful that we don't today interpret the work that was done five years ago in a company against a, a current set of thought processes that have developed. And um, it, we've got to be careful that uh, it's been taken in light of the circumstances and the thoughts which were prevalent at, at the time the thing happened. But remembering all this, the primary responsibility for accounting uh, and audited reports is the, is the board. And that's been emphasised by the new leader of ARGA, uh, Sir John Duplessis, who's a South African businessman who's apparently gone through all the parliamentary commission reviews. He's been drawn, quartered and whatever else is done by the parliamentary committee. And he's now due to take on uh, the FRC leadership and become the ARGA leader uh, when we get round to it. The problem with the way that the FRC has worked is, uh, and also the media look upon it, is the massive fines which are going to the, um, the, the auditors, especially the big four, but also, uh, the next uh, half dozen or so. Uh, there's obviously a, a conception that the, uh, the auditors have got fairly deep pockets or good insurance, uh, and that may well be the case, and they've also got image, and therefore they are an easy target to go for. But please remember, the fundamental responsibility is the directors. The government did talk about 
strengthening that uh, requirement for uh, directors to have um, very obvious and clear responsibility, but at the moment they backed away from it, uh, which I think is a great pity, because I think that uh, it should be clear that uh, they do have a prime responsibility in, in this area. So as auditors, uh, when the spotlight comes back onto them, they need to be transparent in explaining their judgment calls, but also, and this is something which I was taught those 50 years ago, show scepticism, um, yes, uh, relate to the objectives of the business, but you've got to have a gut feel. Does this seem right overall? Let's not get taken in by checklists of uh, ticking, yes, it's done this, done that, the other. You've got to stand back when you're looking at sets of accounts. I think the regulator needs to do this as well. Does it make sense? Does your gut tell you this is the right thing to be doing? Um, try to come away from a computer generated checklist which you could pass all the individual items, but not pass the test of someone exercising good professional judgment. That is what the good auditor, the accountant in industry and also in the profession should be being trained to do, should be thinking all the time, what's the, the right way to go about it. There's interesting actually earlier on, Bill was talking about uh, ESG and, uh, and how there'd be self-regulation for that. For those who are public companies and publish their accounts, we, we have what we call the soft front end of a reporting accounts. I mean, you may have 200 page set of reporting accounts, which uh, most of which is uh, unintelligible to the average reader, but there might be the first uh, 150 pages, which are festooned with a nice lot of photographs, uh, which in which they tell everyone how good they are uh, at meeting ESG and all these other um, requirements. Unfortunately, most of it is written by PR experts rather than by people who actually know the facts. I think there's going to be a mood where auditors are going to have to be able to find some better way of giving assurance on the, uh, um, the conclusions and the, uh, the statements that are made in that, uh, the, the front end of the accounts. We need, and there are ways, there's something called a B company, which is an organisation which does independently assess the claims that people have made for uh, meeting the sustainability, diversity and et cetera type uh, requirements. And if, uh, if that can be taken to a point where the audit opinion is extended to give assurance in whatever form, with whatever caveats, and we're all very good at caveats, uh, then that would be uh, give more um, uh, support to the reader of the accounts that what they're reading is not just uh, PR blur. Now, We've had a, a lot of talk from Arga about them going to move to emphasise the improvement element. And Jan de Plessis has talked about that in, uh, in his submissions. So I'm hoping that not only will they actually be helping to improve the regulatory situation in which they're operating, but also they can be seen to be. And that does need a bit of a, a media uh, emphasis. It does need the, the regulator to be upfront explaining what they're doing and explaining uh, all the other aspects other than just the fines. So I hope we, we can see a more positive approach by, by the regulator. But we do have an interesting situation with Arga. Uh, it's taken up from the FRC, which, uh, as was mentioned about with the, the health and safety part, uh, th there's been a lack of resource, but now there's talk about a 70% increase in the resource available to Arga for them to take on a wider range of regulation. Uh, how effective it will be will be one we'll all judge in 10 years' time. Uh, but the one area where they are going to take more involvement is in look at local authorities. You, you'll have seen that some local authorities have moved into uh, investing in related or not too related businesses to help to offset the reduction in grants uh, support they've had and they've uh, got caught by problems in the electricity supply industry. So some of them, I think is one in Bristol and one in uh, Warrington, have ended up uh, losing uh, well millions of pounds from investments in an area which they really didn't have the expertise, one could argue, for investing into it. And this is something which I think needs to increase the governance on those sort of um, loosely regulated areas and where uh, a lot of public money has been, has been wasted. Right, you've heard a lot from all three of us. I'm going to leave you with three questions. I'm sure you'll have lots more, but just as a starter. Recently, the Institute uh, of Chartered Accountants received £13 million from the settlement of the fine on the KPMG from uh, the Silent Night investigation. And the uh, 
the people at Silent Night uh, said that this money should have gone to their pension fund, which is underfunded. And the institute said, oh, no, 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 no. We, uh, we, we carry out a core regulatory work alongside the FRC. We include a lot of money, we include a lot of cost in uh, covering that. Uh, and this is one way of covering our costs under what is known as the accountancy scheme. We just need to know what you think about that, whether that money should have gone to uh, the pension people or whether the institute, which is the representative body for uh, chartered accountants should actually be profiting from the misdemeanors of its own members. It's an interesting combination. Secondly, uh, one of the problems of this media aspect, which I've gone on about, is is this affecting the uh, recruitment or retention of skilled people to become trainees in the accountancy world? Uh, do you want to join a profession where you are ridiculed in the press uh, on an almost weekly basis? I think that's an interesting one to decide how we adjust for uh, uh, attracting people to what is a very demanding, challenging, and I actually think very uh, interesting uh, profession. But finally, we'll talk about crisis. Will Arga, and, it's, and this is the one specific example I've been using, will it make a significant difference? Will we find that this light touch regulation that Bill talked about, the self-regulation, will Arga be able to work alongside that and help to bring a better situation for businesses as, as we move forward? Is it going to be evolution or is it going to be revolution? The, uh, uh, the tendency in all institutions is it becomes evolution, a very slow evolution. Um, I am some of my co-authors think that revolution would be a better way if we could only do it. So the jury is out. Uh, you may remember the comment of leopard and spots that never change. Well, let's see if the Arga can change. So come on, over to you for all the questions. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Rod, and thank you to um, Gordon and Bill as well. Um, so we've got some questions that have come in, so I'll um, direct them to each of you. The first question, though, is for all three of you. So um, I don't know whether somebody would like to take the lead on answering this. Um, so can the panel tell us a bit more about B Corps and how regulation interlinks with sustainability? Well, I think I mentioned the B Corps. It's a uh... It's a company set up, I think, from the from America, and it's mainly with SME level businesses where they set uh, parameters for people meeting uh, various requirements. If anyone uh, follows uh, PZ Cousins, they are uh, the salt people uh, based here in Manchester, but operate internationally, and they use a lot of palm oil. And what they're looking to do is to um, get B Corporation uh, certification to show that where the palm oil that they use in their soaps and shampoos um, are coming from sustainable sources and that this can be quantified and checked rather than just be a broad statement. So that, that's my background understanding of the B Corporation. I don't think it's been taken very fully by the FTSE 100 type level businesses as yet, but I feel that or something similar is, is going to help to give us um, a better understanding and uh, respect for the comments that are made in this regard. Thank you, Rod. Um, next question is for Gordon. Um, so taking on board Rod's suggestions to audit ESG statements, who would you suggest do this for banks, the FCA or another body? Um, I, well, I, I have a kind of broader view about the audit, audit professions and the, the issue it's faced in its business model and the way it's structured um, that I think, I think it, to kind of follow on from Rod's, Rod's points, I think, I think we do need more significant change. I, I don't think the, the changes are enough to prevent the, um, some of the issues we've seen before. I mean, there's been recent um, reports that have come out about the quality of audit effectiveness and it's still shown that a high proportion of audits kind of fail uh, what would be described as good uh, audit, uh, audit standards in terms of how those audits have been performed. Um, so you don't have to look too far in, in articles like the FT, for example, to find those. Um, I, think, I think we're almost heading to the point where we need some kind of breakup or statutory audit function. Um, I don't have a, a clear view on exactly how that would work. But what I do know is that the current, uh, the current kind of status quo is, 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 from, is from my research and the things that I've looked at, uh, it, ne it, needs more kind of, it needs more radical change, I think, to, to be more effective going forward. Um, and, I, and I say that as being a member of the profession and having gone through as a trainee auditor, 
um, and, and kind of interacted with auditors in my, in my role and my career and looked at the academic research as well. So, um, so I think it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter which specific body it is. I think it's its remit, its power, and what it's actually trying to audit, because at the moment, there's, there's a huge amount of diversity in terms of the standards for ESG. So there's no consistent standards kind of globally and also nationally as well. It's a soup of kind of uh, definitions that um, are, are very kind of diff difficult to kind of pin down. So, um, but that's partly because it is difficult to solve as well. So, you know, it, this is not an easy task either. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a, compl a complicated answer, but uh, yes, I, I think I think some kind of statutory function uh, would would kind of move in in, the, in that in that direction. I think that would be that would be more effective. Can I just add to that? I think that the uh, the key would be in, in a company's accounts to say what their ESG objectives are, and then the independent assurance will be against those particular objectives. I mean, I take. Gordon's view that these are may, may vary widely between different companies, but at least you say, I want to achieve X, and then someone assures whether or not you have achieved X, and that at least is a start to give us a, a basic point to it. Tell you what interests me is also, it's going to raise, uh, uh, broaden the range of skill sets that are needed by auditors, and that they'll either um, delegate the responsibility for this sort of assurance to other experts, or they might take that skill set on themselves. And one of the things that's coming clear from a lot of the big accounting firms is there's going to be a much greater emphasis on digital technology understanding for new recruits to the industry or to the profession. And uh, I, I think this is where we're going to find uh, technical people working alongside, shall I say, traditionally um, uh, trained accountants to between them uh, act in a much more efficient manner uh, to audit but still keeping the judgmental aspect that I referred to before. Thank you both. Um, next question that we've got says, do you have an opinion about the issue of regulatory capture? So could you argue that the accounting profession have captured the regulator in many jurisdictions? I can, I can take an initial view, view on this one just from, from experience. I mean, I think uh, if you look at the original proposals on, on for example, uh, ring fencing, how those started out and how they ended up, it was clear that there was, there was, uh, there was some kind of process in between that, that uh, set on a particular solution that, that reduced the kind of, uh, the word might not be severity, but the, the scope of ring fencing. Um, and and I think there is a there is kind of close relationships between uh, regulators and and firms. Um, so, but on the flip side, I think we do need we do need kind of more encouragement of uh, people to see regulation as a career um, and a valuable career. Uh, we see it in, in compliance functions as well that um, it, they're often seen as like separate functions, but actually these these functions should really be at the heart of financial services businesses. Um, and, and I think, and I think it comes back to kind of integrity and professional standards that um, you have to stand up and to, to what uh, Rod said about professional judgment and doing the right thing. That should be part of your professional body's requirements, and and then it's uh, up to the professional body to then kind of have a disciplinary process to to enforce that. So, so I think it, I think it's ethically doing the right thing and having professional standards to try and prevent some of these. Uh, regulated, regulatory capture situations. Thanks, Gordon. Um, and then we've got a question um, for Bill. Um, given the change in regulatory behaviour and increased compliance obligations, how can organisations protect themselves against regulatory enforcement or best position themselves in the event of intervention? Yes. Um... With difficulty, I think. Um, no, so so as as sort of regulate new, new regulations come in, the the onus is is on businesses and, and organisations to you know to be, to be aware of those as they come in and to update the standards. So you know, just the the most recent example I can think of is in terms of COVID, where the the regulations sort of for workplaces changed you know multiple multiple times, and the difficulty with regulatory interventions is that they're not they're often not not particularly quick they take some time to to actually sort of generate and, and to sort of for investigations and, and actual enforcement action to be taken you know during which time you know months years might have passed since that initial decision was taken and 
due to the passage of time, it's not possible to remember, you know, why you made that decision at the time. If, you know, using the COVID example again, well, you know, in August 2020, why did you do what you did in terms of the workplace? Well, unless you've written it down, it's it's very hard to remember. So I think my, my advice, the answer to that question is probably were organisations make decisions based on whatever the, the specific regulatory framework is at the time you know, to, to document that, to, to record the decision making, why they've made that decision with reference to the prevailing standards at the time. And then if there is some fallout or, or criticism down the line, months, years down the line, they can say, well, you know, this is, this is the evidence um, that this is why we were doing it. And, and this is the standard to which we were working. And certainly in my practice, you know, that, that can make the difference between um, sort of the plea that is entered, you know, why did you make the decision that you did and, and did you document why you, um, you you made it? So hopefully that's that's answered the, the question. But I think documentation and, you know, recording why certain decisions are taken is is key, I would say. Thank you, Bill. Uh, question for Gordon. Um, so you mentioned about encouraging new business models of banking and to diversify the banking um and over the last 10 years, attempts to do so and create competition have failed partly due to regulation. How do you think then we can get a more diverse banking sector? Um, I think I think we need to we need to think about the objectives that we're trying to achieve. I mean, that needs to be the, the first uh, the first point, because I think uh, post crisis, it was very much. Uh, you know, try and save the banks through uh, capital injections, liquidity facilities and so on, all the interventions that were taken. Um, and, and we've kind of moved beyond that, that period almost now, um, although RBS obviously still, still partly, partly state, not West, I should call it now, uh, partly state owned. But I think, I think uh, we now need to look forward and say what kind of, uh, what kind of banking sector do we want and, and what kind of diversity do we want of a business model and then set the policy and regulation to achieve that. Whereas what happens at the moment is that the policy and regulation has very much been left to, to kind of the market forces when in reality, we're not really in a kind of free market where the state has to step in and, and bail big banks out who, who have a funding cost advantage because of that. So we need to kind of accept that and then say, well, actually, given that, we then need to, to have more promotion for banking uh, organisations like, um, like community banks, like credit unions, who've really suffered from things like... Uh, you know, policies on, uh, on on kind of quantitative easing, you know, pushing down yields, for example, has really affected credit unions um, to be able to generate an interest margin. So there's a there's a there's a policy objective uh, combined with a regulatory objective that that needs to kind of uh, be rethought and and reimagined to kind of say right, how can we have a more diverse banking system that's more in line with say the US, Germany, you know, all these countries that have a much more varied banking banking sector that actually reduces systemic risk because you're not concentrated all on shareholder value banks doing the same things at the same time. Thanks Gordon. Um, and Rod, um, question, is the issue with regulation a matter of competence or capacity within the regulatory environment? Interesting. Um, well I think they're trying to increase the capacity uh, because, uh, as I said, there's going to be a 70% increase in the resource available to Arga. Competence is really what just referred to, uh, to there by Gordon. Are we attracting the quality people into regulation um, where they see it as a challenge uh, that they can rise to and pursue their career? I think in the past, when regulation was seen to be a little bit of a box ticking situation, it didn't necessarily attract the best people. But I've no inside track on the competence of the existing people now. Although I think with Jan de Plessis and Sir John Thompson as the chief exec of the uh, FRC, they have people who have shown themselves uh, very willing to uh, treat the topics in a very positive way. And so I hope it is something that. Uh, can be seen to be working complementary to the professional firms to encourage uh, a better scenario for all of us. So uh, if we can get that um, attitude in people's minds and in the media, then uh, hopefully we are attracting the, the right competence. Thank you. Uh, and a question for uh, all three of you. Um, 
like to hear from the panel, how do they feel about the future of regulation and what changes specifically that you would like to see? So I don't know if Bill wants to start. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, as someone who makes a living from sort of responding to, to regulatory intervention, I'm, I'm sort of quite happy for there to, to be more, to be honest. I think what I see is, you know, the, the, the next sort of, the, the big thing that is coming is, is this, the ESG, the environmental, the, the demonstrations of, of organisations, um, environmental credentials, to be honest, and, and the sustainability. And we've, you know, what, what to, to pick up a point uh, that Rod mentioned, there's, there was a sort of a, a draft act which went through Parliament and, and then didn't progress in the last session. But in, in terms of food um, labelling, where it was proposed that sort of all food packaging would include declarations of sustainability and that the production of that food, that particular food substance, you know, did, didn't, um, Nick sort of reduced biodiversity and promoted the environment. Um, so I think that that's the, the very much the clear direction of, of travel. So I think it's, you know, not so much what I, I would want to see, but I think what, what is going to come is, is sort of in, in environmentalism and, and sustainability and sort of measures to, to combat climate change is going to come increasingly to the, to the fore and, and to pick up on a point that's already been mentioned, you know, it, it can't be just in a, a tick box exercise. It's got to actually mean something when businesses say it and, and sort of demonstrate you know this this is what we're doing it's not just a, a tick box exercise or something we say in the the yearly accounts perhaps i can just add uh, in the accounting world there's been a question which is the one the sec re raised which is in the papers this morning uh, about whether there's sufficient independence between the auditing side of a firm and the non-auditing services uh, my own view is as we um, move towards uh, a situation where the assurance is covering a wider range than just the financial statements, then the fact that they have access to expertise within a firm that covers not just the finance, but also the, well, use the word ESG, etc., then that, that, that can help the improvement in it. I'm not sure that this excessive concentration on independence uh, is is, uh, is, necess is necessary. I think certainly for mid to smaller size companies, an auditor who can empathise with the objectives of the business and bring more um, knowledge and skills and etc. Et to the party uh, can help to improve it. Um, uh, I mean, there has been talk of uh, joint audit as well. Uh, I experienced that many years ago in France. Uh, where it was just really a way to make it look as if something was being done about George audit. But in fact, the, the main auditor still had to, uh, in effect, audit the joint auditor, who was a small firm taking over part of the business. Uh, it, it didn't really solve the problem. And I, and I think this separation of duties is something that uh, could be a mistake, if, but we do need to make sure that people do exercise independence in the proper way. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all those comments. Uh, so unfortunately, um, due to time, we'll have to leave it there. Um, so I would like to thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. And thank you in particular um, to Bill, Gordon and Rod um, for their uh, involvement in today's discussions and for answering all those questions. Um, and obviously, thank you to the Chartered Bank Institute and ICAW uh, Northwest and for Manchester Metropolitan for organising the event. Um, if you would like to listen again or have colleagues that have missed um, this recording, uh, the Chartered Banker Institute will put the recording on their YouTube channel so you can watch it back or share it. The next uh, session is going to be in April um, and is another of our introduction to sessions and this time it'll be an introduction to pensions on the 27th of April at 1pm. So hopefully you can all join us then. Uh, so thank you once again for joining us and I hope to see you soon.